Good day and welcome to the GEO Institute 4th Annual Live Streaming Web Conference. Today's topic will be grouting and the program facilitator is Nico Sutmuller. This is an audio web conference. You will hear the presentation through your computer speakers and there will be a PowerPoint presentation that will be shown throughout the meeting. You can ask a question through the online web conference tool at any point during the session by clicking on the Ask Question button on the left of your screen. Type your question into the box and hit the Send button to submit your question. I'd now like to turn the floor over to today's facilitator, Nico Sutmuller. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome everybody for attending uh, the uh, grouting webinar for GEO Institute. Uh, today we've got four exciting speakers that will be uh, giving some short presentations. Uh, we'll give you approximately half an hour apiece for this two-hour session. Um, I am uh, Nico Sutmuller and uh, I will be moderating this session. And the slides are coming up. Uh, I am the uh, Global Lightweight Peel Specialist for Eric Industries, and I uh, work in conjunction with our technical staff uh, in providing the knowledge and experience on numerous geotechnical, civil, and structural issues um, with lightweight fills. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce you to our very first speaker, uh, Andrew uh, Ferrero, is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Oregon. He received a bachelor's and master's degree in civil engineering from Portland State University with a focus on geotechnical and structural engineering. He now works as the North American Geotechnical Manager for the NEF. Andrew is focused on developing uh, permeation grounding standards and providing solutions to common problems in civil and geotechnical engineering. So welcome, uh, Andrew, and the, uh, I will turn the uh, floor over to you here. Let me just pull up this, your deck here. And I, it's all yours, Andrew. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Okay, my name is Andreu Ferrero, as uh, Gavin said. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, today we'll be talking about, uh, I will be talking about permeation grouting with chemical grout. Um, chemical grout specifically, we're going to be talking about polyurethane grouts and acrylate grouts today, or acrylic-based resins. Um, <clears throat> permeation grouting is used in soil stabilization, water cutoff, um, and other geotechnical applications, including supportive excavation, uh, water cutoff, and leak sealing. Um, permeation grouting is typically based on the soils that you have, um, and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the background of, of chemical grouting, what is chemical grout, um, so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so polyurethane and acrylate grouts are typically broken in, down into two categories, hydrophobic and hydrophilic. So hydrophobic urethane grouts are, um, are typically, as the name implies, Hydrophobic is uh, water fearing from the from the Greek. Um, they only require about five percent water to create the reaction. Uh, it's a, a light brown to dark brown resin with a viscosity typically in the fifty to three hundred and fifty centiqua. A thin motor oil to a, a very thick motor oil uh, would be a similar consistency. These resins are mixed with a catalyzing agent. And either be one component resins or two component resins. 
those resins are usually pumped with a, a lightweight pump, uh, a paint sprayer pump, for example, um, and they react with the water that is already in the ground or in structure that you are trying to seal. So hydrophiles, as I said before, only use about 5% of the water by volume um, of the resin. Once that water is mixed in with the resin, it does not use any more water, so it will push any additional water away from the resin body. As that reaction occurs, heat is generated. It is an exothermic reaction. In that reaction, carbon dioxide gas is produced as a byproduct, and a foam generates. So as that carbon dioxide is developed, in the urethane, the foam expands. These hydrophobic urethanes can be very expansive. Um, they expand from five, 30 times their original volume, depending on the urethane. Um, there are many different types of urethane and they're used for many different reasons. Um, there are flexible urethanes and there are very rigid urethanes. Um, if you have a a system, for example, a, um, a cold joint in a roadway where you would be experiencing some movement in that cold joint. Um, you could use a flexible foam to, to apply there and create a seal to prevent any water migration through that cold joint. Um, a rigid foam would be more for a, a soil support or in a system where you don't have any movement. Um, the, the, the hydrophilics are different from the hydrophobics in that the hydrophilics like water and they will continually, continually react with water over their lifespan. Once the, the hydrophobic urethane is completely reacted, no more interaction with water will occur, meaning there will be no expansion or contraction if moisture conditions change in the area where the, the resin is applied, whereas the, hydro, whereas the hydrophilics will expand or contract depending on changes in water condition. Hydrophilic urethanes use up to 50% by volume of water. So when the hydrophilic is inject, is it, urethane is injected to the structure or the soil that you're trying to treat, it will use approximately 50% water by volume, and then it will react. Over time, that, that foam that is developed in a similar manner as the hydrophobic, as it, as it expands, um, it'll use that water and create a carbon dioxide gas, which creates a foaming effect in the urethane. Once that hydrophilic urethane is reacted, it will shrink and or swell, swell depending on changes in moisture content. For that reason, typically hydrophilic urethanes are used below the groundwater table. Hydrophilic urethanes have typically a better adhesive quality than the hydrophobic urethanes because they do interact with water a little bit more. They grab on to um, cement and steel and other surfaces a little bit better than the, the hydrophobic urethanes. And they typically have a pretty good elongation. So typically anywhere from 150 to 250% elongation on the urethanes and, and pretty good uh, adhesion as well. Um, these are, work really well in, in cold joints or expansion joints or in cracks that you might be any movement in, um, and they will um, they will maintain their structure as is as long as there is enough moisture in the system uh, to keep them at their uh, reactive volume. Typically, the amount of moisture in a in a moist soil um, will be enough to keep those hydrophilic urethanes hydrated. Um, you don't necessarily need active flowing water or 
standing or a standing groundwater table or a saturated soil condition, um, just a little dampness will, will be enough to keep that um, hydrated. If that, that moisture content does drop um, into a dry kind of state, that urethane, that hydrophilic urethane will start to contract and become um, a lot more rigid, lose its elongation, and, and lose a little bit of its adhesion. So when specifying hydrophobic or hydrophilic urethane, um, good exploration and understanding of the moisture conditions in the system is, is required. Now, moving on to acrylates, uh, acrylate or acrylic resins um, are always hydrophilic. They typically have a lot lower viscosity, anywhere from one centipois, which is equivalent to the, the viscosity of water, up to about 15 centipois, which would be um, about the, the viscosity of a, a sports drink. <clears throat> you mix hydrophilic ac uh, acrylic resins into one in a one-to-one -one, um, one part resin the one part water the resin on the acrylic grouts will be a clear liquid and it's usually dyed with a, a coloring agent so you can tell the difference between the the water side of the resin mix and the resin side of the, of the resin mix these um, these acrylates are activated um, usually by a, um, a salt uh, and, a, and a component called triethylamine. All these all these uh, chemicals, when they're separate, do have some toxicity. But once they are mixed together and reacted, they are non-toxic. Um, so proper usage and material handling is very important when dealing with both urethanes and acrylates um, and so please consult your supplier um, technical support and uh, associated msds's when handling these materials hydrophilic acrylates have really good elongation and adhesion typically typically they have a lot better elongation than urethanes um, <clears throat> the hydrophilic acrylates can elongate up to 300% of their original volume, and they, <clears throat> and they have a much stronger adhesive quality than even the hydrophilic urethanes. They're going to bond to your structure a little bit stronger uh, and create a good seal there so that if you do have any movement in your cracks or expansion joints, um, that, that resin is going to stay attached and create a good seal so you don't have any water intrusion into the positive side of your job site. <clears throat> These hydrophilic acrylates, similar to the hydrophilic urethanes, do need uh, moisture in the system to maintain their structure. If the system does dry out, they will shrink and lose their elongation and adhesion. So as before, um, proper prior exploration and understanding of the system in terms of its moisture content is important. Okay, moving on to the next slide. So the uses for these, these different types of grouts are, are, are very vast and we're actually finding new uses for them as time moves forward. These grouts have typically been used in the leak sealing business. Um, for structures, structures such as dams or foundations, uh, all the way down to uh, basements in residential structures, roadways, or sidewalks. Um, more recently, they have been becoming more present in the geotechnical industry uh, for soil stabilization, void sealing, void fill, um, compaction grouting, and um, <clears throat> And compensation grouting. Polyurethanes, as we said before, usually expand a lot, anywhere from 10 to 30 times their original volume, um, and their viscosities range from about 50 to 600 centipois, uh, and they're typically pumped with a one-component pump. 
the expansive quality of the polyurethanes make them excellent candidates for voice filling. They will be, typically they are pumped into the void, um, and there are multiple methods for injecting these materials, which we'll go over in just a moment. Um, they will react with the water in the system, or you can add water in line to react to the grout if there is no water in the system, um, such as in the void or in the crack. Uh, and they will expand until they reach the limits of the void, and then they will continue. And then the additional material applied inside that void will consolidate the grout, turning the grout from a, a lightweight foam into more of a rigid plastic. The hydrophobic polyurethanes, uh, when they're expanded with no confinement, do turn into a lightweight foam similar to um, insulation foam, um, typically with a compressive strength of around 30 to 60 PSI. If they are confined, they can become a very rigid plastic with uh, unconfined compressive strengths of up to 3,000 PSI on their own. These, <clears throat> the acrylates um, are always hydrophilic. They do not expand. Um, as we talked about, the viscosity is typically below 20 centipause. And they need a one-to-one -one plural component pump um, with stainless steel working parts. The reason for that is the salt triethylamines typically used to react to the acrylates are corrosive. Um, so having the correct equipment is very important so that you don't damage that equipment or change the chemistry of the acrylate material itself. Um, acrylates are typically used for permeation grouting, um, crack and joint sealing, and soil stabilization. The low viscosity of the acrylates make them prime candidates to permeate into tight soils. Um, I've seen successful permeation into um, silts with clay and sand. Um, and these, when you do permeation, typically the intent is to cut off water or stabilize the soils for support of excavation. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Um, so the, the basis for permeation grouting um, is, is really geotechnical exploration. Um, to, to understand the process and what materials you'll be able to permeate into a soil, you have to know the, the smallest grain size. So understanding the geotechnical exploration is important. Um, the effect, knowing the effective size and the unif uniformity coefficient, um, you can determine a, a flow rate using basic Darcy's law. Um, you will be able to understand um, what viscosity of material will be able to f permeate into a given soil. Um, and that is kind of how you make your grout selection based on your, um, your viscosity and gradation curves um, in component with a, a, a Darcy equation. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, understanding the moisture content of the soils is important as well. Um, as typical with all permeability equations, if you have a soil that is not saturated, you will have a little bit more difficulty permeating with a um, We lost him. This is Nico. I'm the moderator for today's session. Um, we're trying to figure out uh, for a second here uh, what's happened to the audio here on that. Um, while we're waiting, I was remiss in the very introduction of the session to 
introduce uh, our gold sponsor, which is uh, Keller Industries or Keller Foundations. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is just uh, while audio is trying to figure out is uh, share with you the gold sponsor. Um, and the companies of Keller of North America um, are uniquely positioned to handle the most complex geotechnical construction projects nationwide, including all services in one contract. Keller reduces client risk and ensures all aspects of a project that are met on time and on budget from uh, Keller Foundations. Again, we thank uh, Keller Foundations for being a gold sponsor on that. And uh, we will now turn it back over um, to Andrew. Bear with me while I pull up the slide again that Andrew was over. Andrew, are you back on with us? We'll give everybody, uh, give Andrew a minute here. Christina or Nadia, can you help me out here? Hello, I'm I'm back yeah, now. Okay, Andrew. Um, we have about eight minutes left on your presentation. If you would please uh, continue here. Excellent. Okay, as I was saying before, the permeation grounding analysis is typically a service that I provide to our clients. Um, so I look at a lot of these geotechnical reports and, and determining which type of grout would be appropriate to use in, in their job. Um, <clears throat> so now we'll tr move toward uh, the injection methods. There are multiple injection methods. Um, the most simple is probe injections. This is simple, uh, simply a steel pipe with a drive probe in the tip. Um, this is driven down to the target elevation. The probe is then retracted a bit to um, to lift the drive probe out of the, the end of the probe, and then grout is injected. In the laboratory, um, we did some experimentation with this method. We had theorized that the grout ball formed from the permeated soil would appear to be something like a sphere. And, and in fact, when we did the trial in the laboratory multiple times, we got a grouted sphere. And now this is a, a, a fairly clean sand with approximately 20% moisture content. Um, and we used uh, soma tube forms that we fabricated ourselves, and we injected approximately one gallon of material, and we were seeing approximately 12-inch diameter for the sphere in all directions. Um, so we postulate that this material, when it is injected in a soil, acts as kind of a Newtonian fluid and expands outward in all directions and creates this nice sphere. And this is great because then you can stack these spheres on top of each other and create almost a, a column in your soil of stabilized soil with the grout. These grouts, um, when permeated into soil, can become very rigid. Um, some of the grouts that we've seen have uh, that have been permeated into soils have compressive strengths. The soil grout combination have unconfined compressive strengths of approximately 3,500 psi, uh, and that's going to be variable depending on the type of urethane used and the soil uh, permeated. Um, the next type is standpipe. <clears throat> this is typically a drilled hole that you insert a PVC pipe that has drill holes on its axis, um, and then you inject through all those um, drill holes at the same time. We <clears throat> theorized that you would get a, a grout formation similar to what you see on the, on the screen, and in our laboratory experiments, we got a, a, a grout form that was very similar to that. 
the most common and probably most well-known type of um, injection method is a uh, tube of manchette or manchette tube. Um, this is a fairly complicated system, but allows you to control and isolate exactly where you want the grout to go. If you want to grout a specific elevation in your job site, this is a great way to go. Um, typically, a, uh, a hole is drilled and a, um, a PVC or steel tube with holes drilled in at specific elevations is inserted and a lightweight grout is backfilled around the annular space and the steel or PVC pipe. A straddle packer or an expanding um, bladder with two expanding bladders is, is pushed down the tube. You expand those bladders around the ports in the, in the tube that you want to inject through, and then you inject, inject through the center of, of the two bladders and they um, inject through the ports in the steel or PVC tube. Um, this way you can easily target specific elevations. <clears throat> we had thought that a, a grout formation similar to what you see on the screen would appear. And in our laboratory, we in fact saw that we got that similar kind of oblong shape. In all of these experiments, we typically see one gallon of grout gives us approximately 12 to an 18 inch diameter grout ball. Um, yeah, so that is typically what we recommend looking at and that is always going to depend on your soil types. So permeation grouting can be used for supportive excavation or for increasing the bearing capacity of the soil. This is an example of a underpinning for an existing building uh, the load has been is needing increase. Um, so the use for chemical grouts could be as this animation shows, you drive a probe in and then you begin injecting at the bottom. And that grout reaction creates these balls. You, you move the probe upward after you inject your grout and you create this column where then you can remove your probe and then you have a stabilized zone that has a significant bearing capacity increase. Um, of course, determining uh, dependent on the types of loads that you need <clears throat> and the soil types, this could be a great solution for your project, which would reduce the excavation need, um, the, the schedule of the project, inserting these probes and injecting this grout takes um, you know, a, a few hours as opposed to days for um, excavation and mobilization of large rigs. Uh, supportive excavation, as you see in this next slide, um, this is a soldier pile shoring wall. Um, the sand was grouted with an acrylate resin, and as you can see, the cut line is very neat there, so there was no undermining of the existing footing of the adjacent building, um, and they were easily able to cut that back to be able to install their, their stem wall. <clears throat> And as you can see, that, that material has enough strength to stand up on its own when it is grouted. Um, so good shear strength in that. Uh, more testing on the specific properties in terms of shear strength and compressive strength on a lot of these grouts is, is oncoming. Um, and I will be publishing much more results as, as, we, as we get them. Um, so there are many applications for chemical grouts in the geotechnical world and the environmental world. Uh, as we talked about supportive excavation, uh, dewatering solutions, these both uh, hydrophobic and hydrophilic urethanes and acrylates are really great for water cutoff, reducing the need for dewatering. You can increase the bearing capacity of the soil um, and you can mitigate liquefaction. A great study done in um, by the professor at UC San Diego was recently done on liquefaction mitigation. Uh, I would encourage anyone who's interested in that to check that webinar out. It is available online. Uh, slope stability, curtain walls, void filling, uh, backflow prevention in ground anchors, and cutoff walls. Environmental remediation, um, you can very easily lock up contaminate, contaminated soils with these products. Um, so that they do not off-gas as they are excavated or they do not continue to migrate because they are contained within this chemical grout mass. 
And um, so there, there are very, there are a lot of applications for this material. Um, this material hasn't been. used very extensively in the industry because not a lot has been known about it. Um, my role with Denif is to understand the product more and how it interacts in soils and how it interacts under loading, varying loading conditions. And so over the next few years and in my career, I will be publishing much more information about this and providing support to uh, engineers and contractors. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, if you have any additional questions or would like to learn more, please contact me at the information on the screen or um, please ask those questions in the Q&A uh, portion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. And, uh, you know, we did a great job of staying within the time there, even with the technical uh, difficulties involved on that. And uh, I would like to uh, just proceed right away on to the next speaker due to time. We don't have a lot of uh, time for um, uh, a Q&A session on this session. Uh, maybe we have it towards the end. I would uh, like to introduce at this time our uh, next speaker, which is uh, Milton Gomez. And he is Vice President and Senior Engineer for Eric's Industries. Um, the, he will be talking about subsoil remediation with permeable cellular concrete. Uh, he has worked with cellular concrete applications since uh, 2005. He is responsible for overseeing all operations, including sales, engineering, and technical support for the entire organization, both nationally and internationally. He has designed and assisted in the development and implementation of technical product systems and engineering evaluation practices on materials and equipment for Eric's Industries. Mr. Gomez holds a BS in Civil Engineering from Temple University and a MS in uh, Engineering Management from Drexel University. He has worked with cellular concrete mixes for a wide variety of applications. These applications include load-reducing backfill tunnel, annulus grouting, mine subsidence, and building construction applications. He is also actively involved with a major industry organization, including being the current chair of the ACI 523 Committee on Cellular Concrete. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, turn the time over to Milton. Um, and I will pull up his presentation here. Well, thank you, Nico, and thank you all for joining us in this um, day, Friday, right, TGIF. So we'll try to make this presentation go as, as smoothly as possible. Like Nico say, um, Milton Gomez from Eric's Industries. I've been involved in the industry itself in the last 14 years, going to 15 years, excitement. Um, we've seen the industry grow. So today, presentation, I'm going to be focusing mostly on soft soil remediation with permeable cellular concrete, right? Um, I use cellular concrete as synonymous to cellular grout. It's going to be also synonymous with um, low-density grout, low-density cellular concrete. So bear, bear with me. Um, being that I'm second-term chair with the cellular concrete committee nationally, internationally actually, it's, I do use the word concrete a lot. But please mind that concrete and grout is, is going to be the same. I, I do thank you for it. So moving along. Okay. The definition of low density cellular concrete cellular grout is um, by ACI, which is the American Concrete Institute, as defined in this slide. It is based on three ingredients: cement, water, and foam. Andreu um, presentation went well. Um, he's talked about chemical reaction foam. This is actually a surfactant type of foam when it comes to the preformed foam. It is a material that tends to be or is designed to be oven dry density of 50 pounds per cubic foot or less. What is, excuse me, what is the preformed foam? Once again, it is a diluted liquid foam concentrate that is predetermined based on industry uh, manufacturing recommendation, and it's expanded to look like the consistency of what we typically see as a shaving cream foam. It is not shaving cream, 
I do not recommend the use of a shaving cream, but just so you can get an understanding for those that have never seen what the preformed foam for sailor grout looks like, it's basically a consistency of, a, of your typical um, shaving cream. The, the technology itself conforms to two, two industry standards. When I say industry standards, it's under American Concrete Institute. As we defined it on the ACI 523 um, in the previous slide, it also conforms to what we all know, flowable fill, control low strain material. For the fact that the product is a flowable, self-compacted, cementitious grout um, that is excavatable, it produces low density control low strain material. It's, it is listed on the ACI 229 guidelines, therefore, um, as engineers, designers, and end users, we're able to um, utilize the technology both as a cellular concrete grout, low density, and as a flowable fill grout, low density again. Basically what it is, is that the cementitious um, material encapsulates the air bubbles. By creating air in a preformed foam, you actually, we, we are creating a low density. You're adding air to the, to, to the material, making it a low density product. Um, it dissipates, and this little voice you see on the presentation is what is in a microscopic view what makes it low density. So you create a lot of minor microscopic air void of the fact um, to make it a low density product. And when I say low density is that the density itself confined to product below um, 50 pounds per cubic foot. Once again, industry standard possible compressor strength is derived based on the density you're driven. The more air you drive to a given volume of product, a cubic meter or a cubic yard, it creates uh, the product to be low. Now, the resistance or the compressor strength of the material does correlate with the, um, the compressive strength and, and the density. Um, the lighter you go in the density, the less of the compressive strength. But also drive all the other properties. Being that it is, it is a cementitious product, it derives all other characteristic of properties that you need given on a given final um, product. It, it would it would drive the not just the compressive strength, um, some of the modular elasticity, some of the other properties such as shear strength. So it is very important to know, especially a specifying designer, that given the density or and compressive strength is really what drives your typical presentation or specification. I do I do get challenged sometimes that some engine uh, some designers don't want to get something like three thousand psi, but yet you're limited at the given density. For the fact that the product itself it is driving air into a cementitious slurry to make it a grout, and therefore by driving the air into the mix, you control all the other properties as it. One key thing that I want to mention as we move on to the next few slides is that cellular concrete, cellular grout, it is an engineered backfill material. It is not designed to be structural. It is used as a structural, this in a structural system, like in roofing, but meaning that this is a grouting um, geotechnical presentation. We're going to be focusing mostly on, on the geotechnical side of things. So, as you look at the, as you look at the technology, it is um, it is an engineer backfill solution in areas where you have low reductions or some low factoring product that typical backfill are not practical or feasible due to the design constraint. Sailor, low density sailor grout is where the key to the success of, of the benefit of the product because this is a permeable presentation. Our focus on the permeable study was that, like I say, you know, this is a, a product that's going to be replacing soil because of the backfill, a typical, typical soil backfill. And the typical backfill is that soil is, tends to be naturally permeable. 
um, even clay. If you wait long enough, water will go through clay. Um, not as good as sand or anything else, but it eventually could go through, soak it in or absorb it within time. So our study was, okay, can we create a, the, the technology, can we create a product that we can engineer a solution that can actually imitate what a, the natural soils tend to do? Um, it did derive based on the properties and the characterization of, of the material. And the benefit of it is that it is an engineer product. We control what we want at the end, at the end product. One of the key things for us is like how the challenge, how can we maintain the pore space to allow the water to permeate through the material? So we're trying to create a, a solution that allow natural flow of water that was already there to continue its natural path, but yet control it, the backfield not allowed to erode because it's a concrete produced cementitious grout. So the challenge was, how can we create something that can be self-stable, still be stable, and you can still have a compact itself and be a self-leveling engineer solution? We were able, the, the industry, right, we were able to create a, a solution that the bubble chemistry was different. Um, they are those low-density grout, say so concrete grout, that are non-permeable which the industry is used to saying as closed cell solution. And now based on the chemistry or the bubble chemistry is that the permeable need to coalesce the actual matrices of the bubble structure while maintaining a stability. Moving on to the next slide is that we all Excuse me. The, the one challenge is that it had to be a product that is solid as a mass and yet allowed the water to percolate or permeate through the system, as you see on, on the video. The typical permeability or coefficient permeability is given in this log scale. Um, it is give you a presentation why the, here we use the acumen PLDCC stands for permeable low density cellular concrete, or once again, cellular grout, where you can achieve um, permeability 10 to the minus one to like 10 to the minus three compared to what sand and gravel mixture will be permeable through as you, you see in the log scale. Um, once again, you drive this by allowing yourself the more air of the more of the bubble correlation co uh, co allow you to create a permeability and control the permeability of the product. As you see on the next slide is that I was mentioning earlier is that density drive your character properties, not just only does drive the compressive strength, but it does drive your permeability rate and infiltration rate of the product. Of course, because this is a chemistry based solution is that the more air you have, eventually going to have most of the voids, right? And therefore, the more voids you have, the more permeable or infil the infiltration allow rate is going to be higher. We are limited by a factor, you know, between a 25 pounds per cubic foot to a 35 pounds per cubic foot for the ratios between, you know, surface area of the cement itself and the slurry and the air void content on it. Not only that, the industry has adapted their various testing on, on the job site where they have shown that the saturation void ratios are fairly um, stable on different type of, um, depending on the head pressure on it. Um, study has shown as high as over, you know, the, the low density part, like the 25 density, as high as um, between um, 70 to 80 percent void ratio and a little heavier, less less foam foam in it, or less bubble structure, you can get even a high as 60, 50 to 60 percent boy ratio. What we've done in the industry itself is that we recommend the 
engineers and designers to focus on the 50%. So you out there working on a job that requires a low density solution for the fact that your typical soil will be um, too heavy to handle. You have a product that now able to create permeability, but then you have to always consider, okay, Murphy's, uh, not Murphy's, uh, but uh, physics 101. If you place something lighter than, than the water, it tends to flow. What I like to say in this, converse, in, this, in this slide is that as a designer engineer, the conservative, we are conservative, right? We want to stick with, okay, I put this product, it's light on the water, but 50% of that is going to be a sort into the product before we have any buoyancy calculation. So it is a solution that allows you to have in any water intrusion in the future a low density approach that you know that at least 50% of that fail will be absorbed with the water intruding into it before you have any buoyancy, any buoyancy um, concern. Not only that, you know, studies shown shear strain, um, uh, stress strain, stress strain curve of the product of various density, um, you know, behaves just like um, any other grout, any other concrete out there itself. You peak at a certain, a certain um, deflection and it just follows this certain curve. So it is a product that kind of varies between a, a backfill soil um, replacement, yet has concrete behavior. Not gonna be like normal concrete uh, or structural concrete, but it behaves just like a mass, like a concrete mass itself. Um, and the next, this is just a, a little bit of the, of the history of the, of the technical uh, of the product itself. Moving on is I want to discuss a, a couple of case studies that this product was used and why it was used. <clears throat> One of them, um, I'm actually my my office and like you know Nico introduced myself. I, I am from Pennsylvania. The one of the project was here um, in Pennsylvania. It is the U.S. Route 30 in Pennsylvania, which is one of the route that actually um, follows the old Lincoln Highway. Um, it goes all the way from Ohio border almost to the New Jersey border itself to to um, to, to the river outside Philadelphia. The, the challenge here was that uh, a sinkhole appeared on East Route 30 in Chester County, which is right outside the Philadelphia area, uh, just to get you familiar with this, where this project was located. The reason of this is that US 30 does carry um, uh, thousands of vehicles daily in and out of the city for those people that live in the suburbs, not just only vehicles that um, go in and outside the city for people, but also, you know, the, the trucking industry. It's a very major route that goes in and out of the city of Philadelphia. One of the things was that this sinkhole, um, the project layout for this was that PennDOT excavated the area up to bedrock. We did not, you know, after doing so many probes and getting so many um, boring, they, they found, um, the solution. So they actually reinforced the earth of, of under the US 30 medium, as you see in the picture, um, and both on the eastbound and westbound side of travel lane. Um, the reliable solution was that the crew repair the excavate area um, structurally, but then they want to know what can we do in, in, in the meantime, in the medium, to create a, the, the natural flow of water, not to get further further sinkhole, but yet not bring a product that's going to be too heavy to create future sinkhole in, in the future. So the solution was to replace it with a permeable low density cellular concrete cellular grout. As you see in the layout is that the work area was about 120 feet long to 50 feet wide. I like to show this picture is because you notice that there was no major length restriction at all. The construction of and uh, uh, the excavation and the compaction, all that happened. As you see in the picture itself, the crew of itself of 4,500 yards of product was placed by um, very minimal labor. There's no need for any compaction material because it's a self-level and a self-compacting product. So you just pour in place as the product develops. One thing that I like this picture coming out, people ask, when can you put major low, when can you start paving? So Friday was the last day of the job backfill. I figure we had a major rainstorm that, that over the weekend on Monday, I showed up to the job site thinking there's gonna be um, some question from PennDOT itself. I showed up around 
7.30 in the morning, and this is what's happening right on the job site. Um, they're already spreading the gravel for the sub base of, of, of the medium, um, and they're ready to rock and roll on, on itself. So as you see, the job itself took about four days of backfilling, um, uh, 4,500 yards of it, and then they're able to replace and remove the backfill within a week of production. The other, uh, knowing that I only have five minutes left, the other, actually 10 minutes left, the other product profile I'd like to discuss is not only is used for DOT, but um, there's a solution here on New Jersey. A North Portal Bridge is being built. Um, Amtrak's actually creating a uh, on the Northeast Corridor, very busy highway for the Amtrak system, a fair rail. Um, and this quarter, um, the challenge was that the original design was an embankment, a three by one embankment. But then you have a major highway and uh, water, water next to it. So one of the solution is, can we create, can we not disturb the natural water or the, the marsh of um, this area by creating a backfill? We don't have the space to do another three by one embankment. So can we create it by building a wall? filling it with the permeable low density grout and then be able to extend our third line or the third track in the future um, once again without disturbing the natural um, flow of water that's been there for many, many years. As you can see in the next slide, the solution was to use a sale of concrete was proposed for use of the backfill material behind the wall to facilitate the construction and to mitigate the settlement concern and contribute to the overall stability of the retaining wall. Um, one of the things of sale concrete being a self-compacted and, and a cementitious product is that once it's, once it's placed, right, you, you deal with your, your plastic face, but once it's cured, it just becomes a mass. In future event that wall fails, there's no sheer action of the material because now you have like a secondary support system because you can remove that wall and because the product is already cured and it's just a mass or a block, whatever you want to visualize, um, it actually creates a secondary support and a, a even greater safety factor. The other thing is that unless you're getting forced from behind, you're not going to, it, it elim almost eliminates any lateral load in that wall unless the load is being applied from behind because concrete is always in the compression state. It never pushes against anything like soil. You have another added value as engineer and designer to do so. Here's going to be some of the construction picture uh, that happened in the job site. Once again, you see how close we are to the rail and what limited access we have compared to the job site. You can see if, um, in the picture is that construction, once again, 14,000 yards of this product, you know, being placed. Um, in multiple phase, I believe this first phase was 4,000 yards, of just um, a, a hose, a grout hose on the job site and just allowed the product to, to pump and self-level. One key thing that we want as an industry is to understand is, yes, great that the water is going through, but we all know with water comes self and some other contaminant that can happen. What the industry has adapted is that if you are going to be utilizing or recommending or designing a permeable low density grout, it is highly recommended or specified the specification that you should use a silt fabric. We all know water in equals water out. Great. But if the rate of water going in is slowed down due to the percolation of the product, if there's some silt or some other contaminant you don't want in there, it, is going, it has the tendency to entrap or it could get trapped into the backfield. So it's highly recommended that if you are experiencing um, that you don't want any silt or any um, things going into the material is to utilize the silk fabric around it from any angles you have some um, concern or some contamination itself. <clears throat> Focus on the permeability of a low density backfield, low density grout is, you know, it is designed to provide the compressive strength needed as we just discussed earlier. It also gives you the reduce the load placed on the assistant soil. Um, in this case, you know, with the sinkhole itself, it also gives you a added value of the allow the natural flow of water in the backfill without any concern of any future sinkhole or any repairs in the future.
finalizing my presentation is that, you know, what conclusion can we draw about soil and concrete or low density soil concrete? It's very versatile. Um, in many cases, very economical due to the production rate. Um, some of this rate can be as high as 150 to 200 yards an hour. This also gives the designer, engin an engineer, and specifier, and end user some flexibility of um, changing anything that's needed to meet the project. Um, I always like to drive this that no longer does do we engineers need to adapt to a product. Now you can design the product to meet your project needs. And in that case, Mr. Nico, I always like to finish my presentation in that comment. I open it for some questions with some five minutes left. Great. Thank you, Milton, and uh, appreciate the input. Um, we do have an extra minute here, so um, we did not get any questions uh, asked from the audience. Um, but let me ask you a question, um, if I might, here. Um, obviously, uh, there's cement being a driving factor on that. Uh, what levels of fly ash substitution can we utilize um, within the various mixes to potentially drive uh, costs down? Uh, the industry itself have adapted like a 2080 rule to start. Um, flash and slag cement, Nico, are now our uh, driving factor to keep the cement costs down. By adding 20% of the flash and or slag cement, it allows you to be a little bit cost effective on a, if you're comparing, you know, the cement only product. Now, it's highly recommended that if you are going to make any changes on the mix design itself, um, it is recommended to do testing prior. Uh, we have worked with end user. We, as an industry, have worked with an end user that have used 100% flies in their mix and still meets uh, meeting the properties. We all know in the industry, if you do use some slag or fly ash, it tends to slow or delay your 28 days compressive strength. But we also notice in the industry that at 56 days, the product tends to be even stronger if you were to use meat cement itself. Well, thank you, Milton. Uh, much appreciated. And uh, we're going to be moving on to our next speaker here. And um, that would be, it's called pulling it up here. That would be Sam Vandermeer. And Sam is today is going to give us an overview of the ASC the GI 5319, which is the Compaction Grouting Consensus Guide. Sam Vandermeer has more than 40 years of management and contractual and geotechnical specialty drilling experience. In 1975, Mr. Vandermeer founded a specialty grouting company, which became instrumental in the development of the compaction grouting Denver system. Due to Mr. Vandermeer's involvement in the academia aspects of the grounding industry, the Denver system was recognized and marketed on an international basis. In 1996, Mr. Vandermeer sold his grouting company, became a specialty field grouting consultant dedicated to the support of other grouting companies. In 2016, the ASCE Geotechnical Grouting Committee chose Mr. Vandermeer to be chairman of a subcommittee charged with the update of the Compassion Grouting Consensus Guide, which was first published in 2010. The update was completed this year and is listed in the ASCE publications as document 5319. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Sam. And I'm bringing it up right now for you, Sam. Sam, please uh, take it over at your leisure. All righty. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be a part of this presentation today. and. Uh, Obviously, my uh, presentation is to deal with the Compaction Grouting Consensus Guide. I'd like to just maybe do a little bit of a, uh, a, a review of uh, where, we're, where we've come from, uh, where we're at, and where uh, we see ourselves going with the Compaction Grouting application. Uh, the Compaction Grouting application was actually simultaneously the concept of it was simultaneously conceived by two contractors out of California 
uh, and Ed Graff uh, out of San Francisco and Jim Warner out of Los Angeles uh, back in the late 50s um, trying to deal with control of grout, uh, pumping fluid grouts, how do you control them, how do you uh, limit their travel indexes and so forth. And so they were both kind of dealing with um, the issues of um, uh, thixotropic uh, issues, how can you make grout just travel so far and, and stop, uh, rheological properties, uh, maybe adding some aggregates to it and so forth to um, uh, limit the travel of these grouts. And so um, uh, in 1962, uh, Ed Graff actually wrote the first paper, and I thought I had a copy of that. I went through all my uh, records. I couldn't find a copy of it. But uh, he wrote the first paper, and he coined the term compaction grouting in that first technical paper that was presented uh, at an ASCE uh, conference. Well, um, not to be outdone, Jim Warner, uh, who is probably one of the most, uh, whoops, I got the wrong. Jim Warner has probably written more technical papers uh, on the application of compaction grouting than any author I know out there. Um, just num due to mainly because of the number of years he's had to work with it. But um, uh, he's uh, been a, a, the guy that's probably the godfather of the whole system. Um, Ed Graff was somewhat senior to um, Jim Warner in age, and so his career came to an end earlier than Jim, although Jim seems to be our energizer bunny that uh, I'm not sure he's ever going to give up for. Uh, on his career, and that's good because he's got a lot to offer. So anyway, a lot of these technical papers were written uh, through the 60s, the 70s, uh, up into the 80s. Uh, a lot of these technical papers written on compaction grouting, case histories, uh, uh, just the technical understanding of what we're doing with these low mobility grouts, uh, these very stiff grouts that when you inject them, uh, they just stay in a homogeneous mass. Uh, they do not travel. And uh, so uh, we have a good control of a, of a grout when it's injected. Well, I came on the scene about late 1979, in early 1980, and um, looked at what Ed Graff and Jim Warner uh, had done uh, with equipment. Um, up and until that point, what they had done is tried to modify equipment that was really made to pump uh, fluid type grouts. And when you do that and, and try to pump a stiff grout through that, it just doesn't work very well. And so they did a lot of modifications. They, Jim Warner actually developed his own little uh, modified mortar pump that he was doing the work with. And I looked at these, this equipment uh, when I came on scene and said, "There's at that point, um, there's got to be a better, a better way of doing this as far as uh, the mixing, the pumping, and so forth." So I, um, I looked at the concrete pumping industry, and uh, at that point, the concrete pumping industry was coming on, was well established, and and was coming out with some. Uh, new types of pumps and so forth. And so I, I took that equipment and uh, modified it. Uh, because when you're looking at the concrete industry, the name of the game in the concrete industry is volume. How fast can you move a yard of concrete from point A to point B, uh, out the end of a hose, um, just delivering the product to its point uh, of delivery? But when you're looking at grouting, you're looking at uh, very slow injection rates, uh, very high pressures uh, with um, back, back pressure on this grout and so forth. So uh, a, the actual concrete pumping industry, while it had some great equipment out there, it just had too high a volume capabilities to it to work in the grouting industry, so it all had to be modified to slow it down and uh, give it uh, the ability to handle the back pressures that we needed in the grouting industry. 
1997, I, I wrote a paper uh, based on what we were learning uh, through the years with the equipment and its development and so forth uh, on, on the state of the practice. Um, and uh, that paper pretty, pretty much focused on the equipment and how we were developing the equipment to be able to do the application better uh, with better equipment and so forth. But as you know, through the uh, 1990s, um, up into the uh, 2000s, the computer industry was uh, coming online and uh, a lot of developments going on with computers. And so uh, this paper really, while it did mention computer monitoring and so forth, didn't go into that in very deep depths because it was so new um, and, um, and we just uh, didn't have the knowledge at that point, but we did have some um, very good success with the equipment development over the years. So uh, in, uh, in the year 2005, at one of the uh, grouting uh, committee meetings, uh, a group of us got together and said, well, what we really need to do is to um, update that state of the practice paper to a ASCE uh, document that would be a consensus guide of all the knowledge of, of different disciplines within the industry, the geotechs, the contractors, the manufacturers, and so forth, and, and put together a consensus guide uh, with all that technical data put together into that one document. We started working on that document in 2005, and as you can see, it really it wasn't published until 2010. We worked on it for five years, putting all that information together, and it was a very good document. Uh, uh, I think at, at the time addressed all the basics and and uh, the technical aspects of where we were at up to that point in time. Well, in 2015, it was because of the computer monitoring and, and, and the um, improved understanding of what we're doing in the ground, a lot of um, very interesting case histories of uh, stabilizing, releveling huge structures, uh, coming online with projects that we hadn't found a, a structure we couldn't stabilize and relevel. Uh, including high-rise buildings, uh, uh, power plant chimneys, and so forth, there needed to be an update on on the com on the compaction grouting monitoring, where we, uh, with the internet, uh, could put uh, live data onto a website and with passwords be able to watch what's happening on a project uh, from anywhere in the world. Um, so um, the, the engineer no longer needed to be out there on site watching what's going on out there. He could monitor uh, the grouting. He could monitor the, the re, uh, reactions of the structure, uh, all kinds of things from his office. And so uh, we wanted to update the Compassion Grouting Consensus Guide uh, to accommodate all of, all of those um, uh, updated uh, issues that we were dealing with out in the field. Well, uh, the committee con consisted of, for the update, uh, considered, consisted of 19 people, and um, it um, had all of the, um, uh, the, the following um, uh, people in it as far as um, disciplines were concerned. Obviously, we couldn't uh, get anybody from the regulatory side. We couldn't find anybody from uh, building departments or whatever that uh, knew anything about what we were doing. So, uh, but we did have um, the consumers out there, uh, FHWA, uh, um, Corps of Engineers, Bureau of Reclamation, and so forth, uh, kind of on the consumer side. Uh, we had uh, engine, the engineering uh, industry represented very well, and of course the contractors. So uh, with the com committee, we uh, we were um, to look at the 2010 uh, 
document and review it for, first of all, grammatical errors. You'd think with 18, 19 people uh, on a committee that the grammatical errors would uh, all be corrected. But uh, uh, once you publish a document, it seems like we were able to find some grammatical issues that we need to deal with, which were very minor. But um, more than that, we wanted to review uh, the topical presentations and how we could better uh, present some of the topics that are uh, in, presented in the document. Uh, also to review uh, the guide for industry advancements, and that really had to uh, deal more with the uh, uh, computer monitoring than anything. So our goal was to update uh, the, go the document to current standards and um, uh, current practice recommendations. <clears throat> well, the committee uh, uh, work re resulted in uh, several things. But one of the main ones was that we felt like uh, in the 2010 document, uh, monitoring and verification was all in one chapter. And we felt that those issues needed to be dealt with separately. So we split them apart and uh, made a special chapter just on monitoring, uh, not only uh, the computer monitoring for the pumping and so forth, um, uh, but also for um, uh, monitoring structures and uh, with strain gauges and uh, crack monitoring and so forth. <clears throat> so, uh, and then we left, uh, and then we put in chapter nine uh, with the verification. Um, Don Shuttle uh, did a great job uh, writing that chapter and reviewing it for us. And uh, that is a very technical aspect of the, uh, uh, the document. Uh, so that engineers can really look at, at what we're doing in the ground in terms of the compacting and, and increasing bearing capacities of soils. Well, uh, one of the areas that concern me the most as a, as a consultant to contractors and so forth is the most difficult part of the compaction grouting application, and that's finding the material and understanding the material that you're pumping. So chapter three dealt with that, and we uh, I personally went through that chapter and uh, tried to uh, make for sure that um, we understand the grout that we're pumping and why it works and how it reacts and so forth. And um, so we we basically have three three issues that we need to deal with when we're looking at the material. First of all, it must be able to be pumped. Uh, if it sand packs, if it blocks off in your hoses and so forth, and you can't get it down the ground because of its back pressures, uh, you, you're not accomplishing anything. The grout must remain in a growing mass in the ground. Um, we want it to gr uh, grow a homogeneous mass and displace the soils that it's being injected into. And uh, so uh, how to get that grout to give up its bleed, uh, bleed water and so forth, uh, the, the water that's uh, used to mix it, it needs to give up that water so that that grout becomes immobile as it exits the uh, tip of the probe. We looked at the, um, the sieve analysis uh, curve limits that uh, typically the uh, grout will fall into as far as a sieve analysis is concerned. Um, Certainly, uh, when you go back to some of uh, Jim and Ed Graff's early papers, uh, that, that uh, envelope was much narrower than what it is today. Um, and the reason for that was because of the equipment that they had to pump with. Uh, they were modifying um, pretty antiquated equipment at those, in those days, and it wouldn't handle uh, the aggregates like we can with these modified concrete pumps. So we could open the envelope up. Uh, today, I, I look at that envelope and just say, well, the reason it uh, cuts off at a maximum uh, aggregate size of three quarter inch is because we're pumping typically through two inch hoses. Um, and so you're, you're, you don't wanna be plugging your hose because of uh, large diameter aggregates. But uh, the, Material, when you look at uh, the sieve sizes, obviously you get down to the 200 sieve size. Anything below that is just silts and, 
and uh, basically what I call a, a pumping aid. That's it's the minus 200 material that allows you to pump the material that's above the 200 sieve. And so um, when you look at this minus 200 material, the plasticity index of it, the PI of it, is very important. If it's uh, got a low PI to it, you're probably going to have to have more of it. If it's got a fairly high PI to it, you're going to be putting less of it in there. But uh, also your cement, fly ash, and so forth obviously falls into that minus 200 sieve uh, analysis, so you can use that to uh, help uh, pump the materials that are above the 200 sieve. So anyway, understanding the, the material um, and finding somebody that can supply you that material with that minus 200 uh, in it. Uh, you can go to um, a lot of places and they'll have um, your concrete suppliers. Uh, they'll have uh, sand and gravel and so forth, but they're not going to be putting that minus 200 material in there because it Number one, it knocks strength down. Number two, um, it dirties up their drums. And so uh, they just don't like pump, uh, putting that material in there. Well, when you look at this material, <clears throat> as it comes out the end of a hose, that slide there on the left um, pretty much just looks like a, a dirty material. Uh, can't see much aggregate in it until you just take that sample and spray a little water on it and you can see as you wash away some of those fine uh, the aggregates that are in there um, and uh, that it's those aggregates that uh, allow this material to have a, an internal friction to it it uh, also if the ground tries to hydrofracture or try to fracture those aggregates are going to plug that that fracture and uh, cause a back pressure so that it continues to move out in a homogeneous mass. So uh, what it actually looks like in the ground is, uh, first of all, you can see there in the lower left, um, you're going to be pumping it at less than a two-inch slump. Um, and so you're measuring that with a, um, uh, a cone. And I, I, I would caution you that if you're going to do that cone test, uh, don't follow the ASTM spec specifications where you fill that a third full, rod it, fill it two thirds full, rod it, uh, and rod that. You have to just simply fill it because um, it, when you're dealing with these very low mobility grouts, very st stiff grouts, when you stick a rod into it, it just leaves a, pokes a hole and leaves a hole in it. So uh, you just simply have to, um, and, and that's true for your uh, strength tests also, your, your uh, strength cylinders. Uh, don't be rodding that stuff in there. You just simply put it in there, kind of pack it in there. Um, otherwise, you're going to poke it full of holes and affect your strengths when it comes to breaking your brakes. But as you can see, uh, the grout does stay in a homogeneous mass as it comes out the tip of that uh, probe. And um, if you've drilled your hole with a minimum amount of uh, annulus space, that grout will just simply come out the tip of the probe, cannot get back up the annulus space because it's so small, and it also will tend to plot, block itself off from trying to come up that annulus space to a certain degree, uh, as long as that annulus space isn't too large. But your goal is to uh, get the grout to stay in a homogeneous mass and also to affect the ground around it. Let me go back here. What you want to do is uh, uh, where that grout is pushing out on those soils around it, you're densifying those soils. Unlike any uh, permeation type application where it's just simply um, you're creating a bulb, but that's it. And what we're doing is increasing the bearing capacity of the soil around the bulb plus creating a, a, a bulb and, of course, a column if you, as you pump, pump and pull. So uh, you're looking for an increase in density of the soil and bearing capacities of the soil around the grout itself. Well, the monitoring, uh, like I say, we've done a lot of work on Chapter 8 for the computer monitoring and so forth. Um, that's, that whole chapter was updated for you. Um, and it basically covers uh, five segments, uh, why monitor, what to measure, um, uh, 
the automatic monitoring of grout injections, the grout monitoring machine, monitoring of structure movements, uh, and then how to how to present that data. Um, uh, in 2012, at the International Grouting Conference in New Orleans, there was quite a ruckus. Uh, because a lot of the contractors are developing their own uh, monitoring systems for grout uh, monitoring and so forth. And it, there was quite a discussion about how do you present that uh, information. And so uh, we thought that was important to include uh, that in, in this document. Uh, the verification, uh, which is, as I say, the um, section that uh, Don Shuttle, who is, um, I, I got to say, I don't understand everything she wrote in here because it goes over my head, but she's a finite analysis type person um, and uh, did a great job of uh, dealing with in situ um, uh, ground improvement methods, means and methods, and I think that chapter it speaks for itself. But one of the things, um, uh, Chapter 9, well, Chapter 9 has four sections to it. It's the overview of verification development, planning verification uh, methods, and, and summary and a conclusion for that section. Um, but one of the things uh, that we were very concerned about is we didn't want to um, get so technical um, that, as you can see down here in our last conclusion that we become so high tech, you, you forget to utilize the old standard, what we call low tech means and methods. I don't care if it's putting some um, duct tape over a crack or using a, an old crack monitor or um, a dial indicators and so forth, just maybe, maybe just an old copper, carpenter's level um, using strings. Uh, so don't forget those systems. They're, they're still very applicable. But uh, just wanted this document to also um, uh, cover the whole gamut of what's available out there for the engineering community as we uh, deal with real-time uh, information that's available. Um, so um, we also, in the document, included some applications that you can do. And, the reason we did that is that this document focuses truly on the compaction grouting application. Um, you'll notice down there in section 10.3, sinkhole remediation and, and so forth, we did not cover that um, because it's really not compaction grouting. I believe it was at the 2002 International Conference in New Orleans that Mike Bile presented a paper uh, that he um, headed up as uh, when compaction grouting is not compaction grouting. And because we were using these low mobility grouts uh, to fill sinkholes, we were um, using them um, to do karst void filling, uh, to slam off high water flows uh, through dams, uh, just a, doing a lot of work with these low mobility grouts. And Mike Vial co coined the term low mobility grout. And so we wanted to keep the term compaction grouting for the actual compaction grouting application where you're densifying soils, uh, stabilizing, re-leveling structures. Um, but when you get into these other applications, uh, we need to um, write another um, consensus guide or uh, another document that uh, beyond what Mike Bile wrote um, uh, when compaction grouting is not compaction grouting. Um, you'll also see that in the appendix, uh, there is a guide specification on how to write a set of specifications uh, for um, the compaction grouting application. And there's also references and index and so forth there. <clears throat> well, you can um, acquire a copy of the uh, compaction grouting consensus guide, uh, 53. 19 by going to the ASCE.org slash publications and just search compaction grouting and it'll come up there. You can purchase it either as a, an electronic down, download or you can get a hard copy of it uh, 
through ASCE. Well, I thought I'd just take you out on a site here by video real quick and let you actually see what the compaction grinding application looks like. Here is a, the material coming out of a, a mixer. You can see it's very stiff um, and uh, typically uh, less, less than a one-inch slump or at max two-inch slump. With these on-site mixing type trucks that I developed, you just simply have the material coming off of a belt uh, with the cement added to it, and you can vary the amount of cement uh, based on the uh, gates up ahead up there that uh, allow either less or more material to a, fine, uh, to a given amount of cement. You see the water being injected to the left, and uh, these um, auger type mixers work very well. Uh, for mixing the grout. I'm going to take you around uh, to the other side of this pump and uh, explain to you that, uh, well, that's an on-site mixer. As you can see, that was a, um, a unit that was purchased uh, from um, a military uh, uh, purchase. Anyway, these pumps, as I say, they look like a concrete pump, and in fact, they are a modified concrete pump. Um, anytime you see um, the uh, model number of it above 20, they, all your manufacturers um, uh, designate their pumps by a number, uh, by a letter and a number. And uh, the number typically indicates the number of yards per hour that that pump is capable of, of uh, producing. Uh, so, um, Anytime you get a number above 20, uh, I don't care if it's a TK20, if it's a, a B20 with, um, uh, or a P20, anytime that number gets above 20, that pump is not going to work for compaction grouting. Monitoring, uh, certainly uh, you can do uh, a manual insert. Uh, Monitoring here, we have a strain gauge that's being monitored on a concrete wall as well as uh, entering uh, the data manually into a, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, you see the header guy out there, um, and he has radio communications with the gal that's doing the entry uh, there on the Excel sheet. So that's kind of uh, just the pumping side uh, of the uh, uh, compaction grinding application. And then I just thought I'd show you a video of maybe doing some typical drilling, and this one has to deal with inaccessible areas where you, you can't get a drill, and so uh, using hand drills. Um, in this particular, and this is real time, is so you can see the penetration rate. Those are three foot sections of casing and you'll see the penetration rate going down. They are doing top downs on this particular job. And in this case, uh, the, the water flush, um, this is a site, doesn't matter where it goes, so they just let it run. Now, if you're in a site where you need to contain that, you can put a box around there and contain those, um, those cuttings coming back up. But, um, there's really no, uh, typically the compaction grouting, the reason you're doing it is because you're dealing with soft soils. And so the drilling is rather easy and uh, not too difficult to do. Um, and um, it's not uncommon to use these handheld uh, drills to be able to get to inaccessible areas. This particular is right here, they're at 30 feet. They just went out the bottom of the, the case of the grout bulb down below. These casings come in three foot lengths. They're flush joint OD and ID that down at the bottom, the, that casing, there's uh, just three teeth on the bottom down there doing the cutting and it's open on the bottom. And uh, the water that's going down is just simply hooked to a garden hose, uh, pumping, you know, injecting three to five uh, gallons per minute as you do the drilling. So I'd back up here and just show you some of the uh, the access issues on this job. It's working on some grain silos, 80 foot diameter, 135 foot tall, uh, releveling those, and you can see back underneath there uh, is an uh, inaccessible area. There's also um, down underneath there was uh, some uh, uh, 
areas that you couldn't get to. Now, it did have a backhoe mounted drill for doing the drilling around the outside of the structure, but uh, these small uh, handheld drills work very well for the inaccessible applications. So I hope that's helpful to see uh, a video of uh, the work being done. So with that, any questions uh, that anybody has, it's been my pleasure to present the uh, Compaction Grouting Consensus Guide, uh, 5319. Sam, we certainly thank you for a very informative uh, presentation that you gave here. And uh, we're going to stay on time. There were no additional questions posted uh, at this time. So what I'd like to do is um, we're going to be moving on to our next speaker for many, and that would be Mike Bile. And uh, Mike is going to be presenting a, uh, a case history on the uh, low temperature uh, damp routing. And uh, Mike Bile has more than 35 years of professional uh, experience in civil and geotechnical engineering. He is responsible for Tetratech's uh, corporate technical quality for civil, structural, and geotechnical engineering services, management of complex projects, training, expert consultation, and professional development of technical, civil, and engineering, engineering staff. He is a member of DFI, ASTM, and a founding member of the Geo Institute of AOCE and the Delaware Valley Geo Institute. He has served as chair of the GI Committee on Grouting and chaired several international conferences on grouting. His background includes extensive experience in investigation and rehabilitation of structures and foundations, soil improvement techniques, stormwater management, including infiltration and best management practices, exploration and mitigation design for karst and project manager management for uh, civil geotechnical and geoenvironmental projects he has completed numerous investigation design and construction projects involving grouting and he has also designed specified and managed construction of grouting for underpinning lateral earth support excavation stabilization environmental immobilization and for hydraulic Barriers, and at this time, I'm going to be bringing up the presentation for Mike Bile. And Mike, I will turn it over to you at this point. Great. Well, thank you for that nice introduction. Um, you know, I mentioned that I've chaired a couple of international grouting conferences. I'd like to let you all know that there's another one coming up uh, in February of 2022 in New Orleans. So mark your calendars and look forward to that one. Um, we're going to talk today about some uh, low temperature dam grouting. That this happened up in uh, as a project that was up in northern Quebec. Um, and uh, tell you a little bit about it. It was a, it was an existing uh, concrete sluice dam with 19 spillway sections. It had it was about 470 feet long and had about 25 feet ahead on it uh, with 94,000 CFS spillway capacity. So it's a pretty good size dam that has a lot of flow. It was built in 1911. It was reconstructed in 39 and 54. Um, and then, but the foundation is built over basalt, and that was one of the issues that uh, because it was uh, you know shrinkage and cooling fracturing in the basalt and at the surface had resulted in a lot of vertical and subvertical fracturing. Uh, or, or, I guess most of the fractures were oriented about 45 degrees, which would made it uh, easy to, to grout. Um, so looking at the dam, I mean, it's a, it's a really kind of a beautiful spot up in the, up in the hill country and in the, in the, in the glacial moraines of uh, northern Quebec. And uh, you can see the, the, the nature of the, of the, of the facility. Uh, we're working, uh, the, this project mostly involves the center portion of the dam. There's a little more of a close-up of what that uh, dam looks like. Uh, you can see the, you know, how the flow works um, and uh, how that goes. Now, what happened was that uh, they originally proposed to do some repairs to this dam, which included uh, removing and replacing portions of the roadway that was atop the dam. Uh, they were going to repair some damaged apron slabs, extend some piers, uh, relocate some sluice gates further downstream, um, and install some post-tensioned anchors to improve stability. 
Well, when they got to actually doing the work, they had some issues is that there was a lot of under seepage on the dam uh, where, uh, you know, so, the, the, through these uh, fractures and, uh, and broken surfaces on the, uh, on, the, on the rock underneath the dam. So there were some large openings and large voids with high flows, and that gave them some problems when they tried to grout this initially. So uh, to give you an idea, here's what some of the apron damage looked like. There were some big holes in the aprons that, that have been, had developed, but you can see the size of the voids underneath there. Uh, there were some pretty big openings that had to be fixed. Um, the, uh, and also when uh, you know, they drilled some holes through the, uh, through the, the apron slab, uh, got some water flow, some high pressures coming up underneath there uh, through those openings. So those those conditions created problems for their uh, for the, uh, the the initial grouting process. So they originally proposed to just inject a primarily a cement grout. They did use some uh, some agents that were you know, to, to, to help it set and cure faster. Um, but uh, as a result, they were they were successful in only 14 of the 19 sluices. So they failed in the high flow areas. What happened was that they actually got the grouting done. Um, and everything looked good. It all locked off. They came back the next day, and all the grout was gone. So it had uh, eroded before it could fully set, and that was part of the problem here. So uh, it required institution of a, an, an additional special grouting program. But what happened at this point, because this, most of this original grouting happened during the summer, and, the, and they were supposed to have the, uh, the, the dam construction work done, in the fall and over the winter so that the dam would open for the spring floods. And so now that these, you know, they had failed, we had these five sluices that they couldn't open right now. So uh, it was, it, and they couldn't finish the construction on the other ones because it had to span across these. So this created a problem and, uh, you know, it was primarily in the area that was clouded here showing, you know, where, where we had the problem cells. They did some dye testing to see what the flow problems were, and uh, pretty much when they, uh, wherever they injected dye, it came up everywhere. So it was it was pretty wide open underneath these and interconnected. Um, and also, we had some pretty good heads in various places that, uh, you, know, you, you know, in some places you could get three or four or five feet. You see, this is later in the season. You can see some ice and snow on uh, in this photo. So. What we did had to develop this phase two grouting plan, which uh, one of the things that we had a problem with is we had to we had to go up into northern Quebec. We had to develop a system that would uh, mitigate any condition we came across. So we had to be prepared. Um, the, you know, the limited knowledge and investigation, you know, because we didn't have time to do lots of investigations and studies on this. We had to get it fixed. So we came up with a, a, a really robust program. We included low mobility grout, uh, similar to what uh, you know uh, Sam just described, uh, to fill the large openings where we put this coarse uh, low mobility material in there to fill the big openings. We had uh, included polyurethane grout, which would you know generally expand and cause you know foam, similar to what your first presentation was about. And uh, we looked at some high mobility grout, which is you know, basically, uh, you know, cement and water for the most part, but it included some other additives to make it more stable. Uh, and then the fourth option we looked at was using that high mobility grout with sodium silicate. I don't know if any none of the uh, presenters have described that. That sodium silicate is often used as, in its own right as a uh, chemical grout that uh, you know can, goes in gels and sets. But one of the uh, Factors of sodium silicate, it does cause a flash set or rapid set within uh, with, its, with of cement. So by injecting that, we were able to control the, the you know cause the the cement to, to to set up more quickly and better resist the under erosion. We took a stepwise approach, inter, uh, iterating as we went along. We also used Televiewer in every grout hole. Uh, you know, a Televiewer is basically a borehole camera, 360 degree borehole camera that we can lower down the hole and observe conditions. Uh, so we did that on every single hole so we knew what we were going into. The idea was we would identify the size and the nature of the openings in each hole and then select the method of grouting based on the conditions we had observed. And it had to be completed over the winter months, obviously. Now we were into the, the late fall at this point when we're getting, uh, we're planning this work and we have to have it done by March. So uh, you know, up in that part of the world, it gets pretty cold in the wintertime.
So the basic plan uh, was was to install a three-line grout curtain at the upstream uh, portion of the dam, uh, you know, close to the center line of the dam. Um, if you see the color coding in there, they were different. You know, we had our initial, uh, you know, uh, containment grouting and our cutoff, and then we had our sealing curtains after that. And we used uh, you know, we used different materials in each one uh, with the la with the with the latest and, and farthest upstream injections being the you know the finest most mobile grout to assure that we had the best cutoff. Okay, here's what the dam looked like when I got there. Um, it was much later in the season. It was all nice and pretty in those earlier pictures, but we had a lot of ice and snow. Um, as you can see, uh, you know, we had roadways built up there that had to be maintained. Uh, we had a pier that was built out on the downstream face for access for the crane. Uh, we had uh, you know, each of those sluices you can see that has the, you know, you can see the white gaps in there. I'll give you a better picture of that, but we had, had enclosures on those so that we could work in there. It was typically uh, between 20 and 30 degrees below zero almost every day I was there. Uh, so it was uh, very, very uh, uh, harsh conditions to be pumping grout. You have to worry about whether your materials are going to freeze, all your, all your lines, all your materials, all of your, uh, your, uh, your grout itself, uh, handling spoils and runoff, your cleanup, everything you do uh, involves water, and uh, water will freeze at 30 below. So um, this is the view from one of the grout bays uh, at the active spillway next to us. This was on a day when it was about uh, about 35 below. Um, if you look at, you see those trees, they're all covered in hoarfrost behind there. It was interesting watching this as the water would splash up. It would freeze in the air and fall back as ice. Uh, it was really a, a unique and complex place to be working. So um, you know, here's what we did uh, as far as those sluice ways is we uh, basically enclosed them uh, with, a, uh, with, with just a, you know, a plastic layer. Um, it, with the things we were worried about were the challenges to mixing and pumping as well as the impact of the grout cure. Uh, think about under that dam we're injecting into water that's got a temperature of just below freezing. Or you know, actually, at or below freezing in some cases, because it's you know it's it's super cooled in some cases, and we got the human factors. I mean, obviously, people have to work in these conditions. So uh, the conditions in the sluice, the upstream face was blocked using reinforced polyethylene held in place with timber framing. Uh, the upstream opening of the sluice was blocked with timber bulkhead. Uh, the downstream face of the sluice was covered with a reinforced polyethylene sheeting, and heated air was injected from above uh, by heaters stationed at intervals on top of the dam. The circulation enabled working temperature between 4 and 10 degrees. It wasn't, you know, balmy, but it was such that you could take your gloves off without uh, having your hands freeze. Um, you know, pumps ran continuously, and the heaters ran continuously. Uh, we had uh, we had to discharge all the water, everything that came up out of the hole, anything that leaked through the the upstream face had to be captured and 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 dealt with. I want to show you quickly. Uh, here's the uh, arrangement of the heating heaters up on the top. Uh, these ran 24/7. They had duct, they were ducted down into the sluice bays so that we had a continuous flow of uh, hot air coming into there. Obviously, since the uh, you know the, with the cold water up one side and the uh, cold air exposure on the other, that uh, you know a lot of heat was absorbed by the dam uh, as as in, in this process. Um, this is uh, a look at one of the sluice ways that after we uh, took the heaters off and, and, un and exposed it. You can see how the ice forms on the upstream face for you know, whatever leaked through that barrier. The snow accumulation and stuff, it was, you know, you know like I say, 35 below in there is not uh, a friendly temperature to be working at. Okay, drilling grout holes. Uh, we generally used, uh, within the enclosed bays, we, put, we used the crane to drop in a piece of equipment. Uh, and this was an air-powered uh, drill. Um, yeah, we had limited room to move. We were able to, you know, scooch this thing back and forth um, and, and orient our holes and locate them where we needed to. Uh, so, yeah, obviously freezing again was the same issues, you know, for, for our coring and all that. Noise was a big thing. I mean, everybody had to wear hearing protection. It was loud inside these bays with any of this equipment working. 
um, for high mobility grout. This was used for for primarily for final closure. Uh, we did use it in conjunction with the sodium silicate for some of our cutoff uh, holes, our initial barrier uh, curtain. Um, and it, it, it consisted of a balanced, stable mix. This is where we take you know basic Portland cement and water. The reason you don't use Portland cement and water by itself is that water will bleed out of it, and it will consolidate, and you will get seepage pathways through it, um, and it can block up. Uh, so if you want it to permeate well, you have to put additives in it to keep the cement in suspension, which is what uh, we added some bentonite, some super plasticizer, uh, some whalen gum, and uh, an accelerator due to the low temperature to help it set. Um, uh, and the components, and also because of the high flow, uh, we wanted it to set quickly. And so the, these were all mixed in heated enclosures and transmitted via insulated lines. And I'll give you a quick look at uh, what the, uh, you know, the, and when we used low mobility grout, uh, which was for voids larger than you know, the few inches. And uh, that was basically a mix of mason sand, fly ash, Portland cement, and water. And, it, and the slump ranged from uh, two, to, two to nine inches. Uh, these were also mixed in heated enclosure and, and pumped through insulated lines. Um, one of the things about the uh, low mobility grout, it was primarily used on the downstream edge to close off the large openings that you know were open in the back, where we didn't want the grout to go flowing downstream. Polyurethane grout. Uh, you know, this is you know you heard the the first paper today was about that. Uh, you know, it, it, talking about the you know the, the nature of the material, it, it generally foams. One of the problems with it, though, is it is temperature sensitive as to how it cures. One of the first tests when we get we got to the site is that uh, we had this near freezing temperature water. We just dipped a bucket of water out of the river and we pumped some uh, urethane into it, and lo and behold, it didn't go off. Um, it probably would have uh, gelled in, uh, if we'd left it there long enough, but the delay in cure time was so slow is that we were certain that it would all get washed away before it was allowed to cure. So this pretty much uh, kiboshed the uh, use of polyurethane grout on the job. So here's what the uh, the mix uh, operation looked like for the uh, high mobility grout. It was in a heated com container. These were just basically shipping containers that had heaters in them, and all the digital controls and mix controls and were were within these. The materials were stored in an adjacent container, um, you know, and kept warm so that they would go into the mix. I mean, the last thing you want to do is take a bag of cement that's at minus 30 degrees and dump it in with water. It's going to make a big block of ice. So um, all of those measures had to be considered in, in the process. Here's uh, these are actually material storage huts. Uh, this is you know first thing in the morning when you get out there, the temperature is you know close to minus 40 at the you know at the overnight, and then it warms up to to minus 30 or minus 25 during the the, the peak of the day. So uh, you get an idea of, of you know the materials were were stored in places like this and then brought inside and warmed up before they were actually used. This is inside one of the bays. This is showing the sodium silicate injection process. What you're seeing there is the little small black line is the sodium silicate line. The uh, yellow line is our balanced stable cement grout coming through, and they're blended at that point where that shutoff valve is and injected down the hole. And what happens is that that, uh, that sodium silicate begins to react with that cement as soon as it's injected, and it causes that, jet, that, that cement to gel um, as it's ejected from the pipe, which helps it to block up any openings and, and causes it to clump up so that it doesn't get transported away during the, the, the injection process. So this is the uh, uh, an overview of the overall set of equipment. What you're seeing is that we had a uh, it, within the sluice bay we had an injection set up where we had uh, our actual injection pump, our injection header, and uh, a flow meter and pressure monitors that we monitored the flow of uh, of the silicate and of the cement at all times. We measured pressure at the same point. It was all digitally recorded, um, so we could record it in real time uh, to see what was going on.
So the exterior conditions, like I said, it's minus 30 degrees C most days. Uh, it's colder at night. Um, ice buildup continued, uh, was continuous due to wave splash, underwater seepage, uh, seepage water, melt water, whatever. Everything we did you know, generated something that froze. Um, and we had continuous crews involved doing nothing but removing ice. Uh, this is uh, a view looking at the, you know, from the dam sluiceway to the, uh, the platform that was built behind with the crane on it. And you can see the icicles and the ice buildup forming on that. All the walkways, all of our support conditions, everything was, was constantly uh, being attacked by ice. Um, and we had to use dipstick and block heaters required to start most equipment. Some equipment we kept running 24 hours because of the cold temperatures. Um, Extra care is required to preserve your grout samples. That's another thing is when you take a sample you know, and you want to test it, you've got to make sure you keep it warm. Uh, you cannot just set it down and, and leave it there and come back the next day because it will be frozen and ruined. So um, here's a little bit about what the, uh, you know, the, the injection response goes. This is uh, you know, our digital plot of, of, of the pressure response. Um, the upper curve is the uh, pressure versus time, and you can see uh, as the uh, and if you look at the lower curve, it indicates the rate of injections. Uh, the red line is the sodium silicate, and the blue is the cement. So what would happen is we start out with cement, we start seeing a big flow going in with no response, com no no reduction. So then we would increase the uh, silicate response, and once we started adding the silicate, you can see that the pressure curve up above starts in you know, increasing on a gradual basis until we got to our target refusal level. Then we would cut the uh, silicate off and continue to pump the, 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 uh, the, the, the neat grout to uh, basically fill in the annular spaces around the clumps of grout that were uh, injected by the sodium silicate. The net effect was, was, was highly effective, and we were able to do our secondary, uh, our next two injection holes without any silicate additive, and it worked beautifully. But uh, this was a highly effective and, uh, way to do this in the cold water and cold conditions. The, uh, the you know the flash set actually generates heat within the within the within the grout that helps with the uh, curing of the uh, of the neat cement grout of the stable and the high mobility grout. So here's uh, a kind of a summary of of what was done. We uh, you know we injected. Uh, you know, 25 barrier holes, which are the initial holes that we, I described with the sodium silicate ad, uh, addition, and we put an average of uh, 62 kilograms per meter of grout volume into that. Um, and uh, except for the uh, the contact grouting with low mobility grout, that uh, you know that was the highest rate of injection that we got anywhere. Everything else was less than that. You know, indicating the effectiveness of our initial injections. Um, the downstream barrier, we had 17 holes that had an average take of 51, slightly less. Um, we did lateral holes between the stages, uh, you know, between the barrier walls, and uh, we got much lower rejections than those at the end, uh, end bays. Um, and we did contact grouting with high mobility grout, which is, uh, you know, which we were trying to fill the gap between the bedrock and the, uh, the base of the dam. Uh, we did uh, 33 injections there with an average of, of 29. Uh, kilograms per meter uh, of injection, and the uh, the contact LMG, which is as I mentioned, is primarily along the uh, downstream toe, uh, downstream I guess heel of the dam, uh, where the uh, where the uh, you know the you know there were there were openings daylighting to the riverbed, so we used uh, low mobility grout at those points. Obviously, it took a lot more grout in those locations because they were large and wide open. We also did uh, what we called relief holes that we uh, had drilled to prevent potential uplift and overpressurization of water under the dam, and those were grouted at the end of the job, um, and those those you know were basically uh, contact holes that were uh, injected afterwards. And then our final curtain uh, grout was another 25-hole line on the upstream uh, side of the barrier, and that took very small injections, less than 12 uh, kilograms per meter square uh, per meter of injection. So that showed that you know that the, you know, what we look for in, in in verification of grouting performance is a successive reduction in the volume of grout that you you're able to inject, or the increase in pressure that you have to inject as in successive stages of the grouting. So the initial grouting does some initial blockages, and your later grouting will fill in the gaps, and so you should have lower and lower volumes as you progress. 
So, um, you know, if we look at by hole sequence, our primary holes, you know, would, would include, you know, we we would do what we call state uh, uh, alternate uh, hole grouting. We would gr we would grout primary, and then we do the ones in between as secondary. And we had a clear pattern of, of reduction in our average take uh, from the primary to the secondaries in every location, um, you know, both in the curtain and in the barrier. So uh, in conclusion, uh, you know, the combined approach of using multiple materials and methods led to successful uh, uh, cutoff. I mean, by, having, by taking all the tools with us and planning, us, planning to use all of these methods, we were able to adapt to the conditions as they arose. Um, like I said, the polyurethane didn't work because the temperature delayed set. Um, the addition of sodium silicate was really a, a, a boon to uh, creating that barrier cutoff and uh, allowed successful closure under conditions that normal grouts wouldn't work. Um, the grouting with conventional cement mixes would not have been successful with the high flows. And also the low temperatures, you've got to remember, you know, delay the set in everything. I mean, cement cures more slowly at, 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 uh, at, at low temperatures, and especially under high flow conditions, it can wash away before it can cure. Um, LMG was not used for cutoff, uh, but because of the success of the sodium stillet, but it was used for the contracting down, uh, the contact routing downstream. And generally, the low temperatures required special measures and attention to detail above and beyond that required for conventional grouting, and it depended on modification of materials, methods, equipment, thermal enclosures, and a lot of dedicated people. So uh, this all went off very well because of that. And uh, with that, I would like to. Uh, Thank uh, ACT Grouting. They were the you know if you they were top notch guys who did most of this work, and uh, I want to give them credit for that. Uh, the photo here is, is is a unique ice formation that forms at specific temperatures. I want to show you these these circular ice flows that develop uh, based on the waves and how they uh, chop up. It was kind of a interesting experience. Sometimes they can get very very big and they look like uh, floating cobbles. But uh, anyway, with that said, anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Mike, well, can you hear me? Mike. This is Sam. Yeah, Sam. Uh, based on your concern for uplift, what kind of pressures did you limit your pressures at? Uh, well, here's 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 the thing. I mean, we actually did a uh, we did belt and suspenders on this. We actually put some additional uh, mechanical anchors into the dam to resist the uplift, and we did uh, uh, basically a uh, uh, a gin type approach where we looked at uh, volume of injection versus pressure and set a criteria based on that. We had a whole table of charts that uh, indicated when we had to stop grouting uh, to limit uplift. Okay. Well, thank you, Mike, and um, I will uh, put this to a conclusion here. I want to thank all the uh, parts, all the uh, speakers for uh, at joining us on this webinar and uh, participating. I also want to spe say a special thank you for our host, uh, the ACI or uh, ACE GI Institute, and. Uh, I wish everybody a uh, very Merry Christmas, and on behalf of uh, Mike Vile, Sam Vandermeer, Milton Gomez, and Andrew Ferrero, um, we wish everybody a very happy holiday season, and Merry Christmas, and great New Year. Be safe about there. Thank you all very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you.